Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's speech at the United Nations General Assembly was met with a walkout by many delegates who chose not to listen to his address. This dramatic exit was a show of dissent and disagreement with Netanyahu's views. Despite this, Netanyahu continued his speech, emphasizing Israel's right to self-defense and criticizing militant Islamism. To further discuss this, I'm joined by AGK Okpa, Global Affairs Analyst, and he joins me from Dallas, Texas. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Okpa, for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's speech was welcomed with a book out. Uh, what is your take on that, uh, looking at the body language of those who seem averse um, to his speech? Well, I mean, that's, that is to be expected. Uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, you know, he's been a very, uh, he served as prime minister for a very long time. His position hasn't changed on going after enemies of Israel, you know, whether within Israel or outside of Israel. And, you know, UN, again, UN is, is the stage that enables people to come and say what they say. Uh, so people wouldn't agree with what somebody say, you know, they're entitled to walk out and, and that's what just happened. Uh, but it, it goes back to tell you that the UN is not an effective organization. Because if UN is all about peace, then there should have been a UN peacekeeping force, you know, in, in, in the contested area of Israel and Palestine. But UN can do it. But UN will have their peacekeeping force like in Congo, wherever since they've been over there and everywhere else. Because the Israelis are supported by Jewish American, American is backing them and European nations back them. So it's one of those do as I say, not as I do. Uh, and this will co continue to, nobody's going to call uh, Netanyahu to order, not Biden, uh, not the uh, prime minister in the in, uh, in, in UK. So uh, Netanyahu has, you know, uh, freedom to do whatever he wants to do. Nobody's going to stop. And that freedom would actually inform the fact that he came on the platform to say that he's demanding from, for Hamas to be removed from power. And, um, you know, I'm looking at it if that's a viable strategy or maybe it's just a political manoeuvre um, to appease his uh, domestic audience. Well, it, it, it could be all of the above. Uh, the point is that he's a demand. He's not even requesting. He's not even suggesting. He said, I am asking you to. Uh, and so he is he's very emphatic on that word, demanding. Uh, again, whether that will convey fear, uh, whether that will make Hamas to, uh, to you know, go back and, and, and uh, regroup. And, and push back. You know, the world is not going to be a peaceful place. Uh, I don't care what anybody goes to the UN to say. I don't know. I don't care how the leaders, you know, go over there and make their 15 minutes of fame. Nothing is going to happen. You know, by the end of this week, this is all over. And then we go back to whatever is facing every nation. Every nation has their political challenges as well as their social economic challenges. I just wish like African nations that constitute about 28% of the membership of UN who say, forget this stuff, we're not going there any we're not going there anymore. We have our own issues. But they're not gonna do it because what they do, they are bigger nations. They just go over there, look like people's people. I mean when she team I talked to the look at the audience, how many people were there? This is the guy representing the most populous black nation in the world and nobody cares what they say. So, so you know, Africa is of it's not of an interest to anybody except occasionally it's mentioned, and everybody says, oh, "Okay, they still remember us." The reason they do it is because there are no strong African leaders, there are no credible Afri African leaders. They act like people's president. So, forget this UN. Don't go there. Tell them, "Hey, we're not coming." Uh, they can have the stage there in Bonafide. You know, you go back to your to to your internal resources and and form your own in member nations and said. We here, you know, let's take care of our own home before we start to look across the uh, defense line. Uh, but uh, Africa itself has its own uh, member nations uh, regionally now. Uh, we can talk about the AU, we can talk about um, ECOWAS, uh, SADAC and the, and the likes. And one of our guests on the show this evening said that these bodies have been redundant. Uh, is there a way we can rejig, galvanize, probably spur them uh, to stand up and, and fight for the rights of um, the African continents? Of course, that's the wish. But the point here is if if the uh, uh, the parts that make the whole are weak, what do you think the, the whole is going to be? If there's no African leader that has res respect or credibility. I mean, okay, let's take at ECOWAS. ECOWAS has the greatest 
number are the largest number of countries in a region 50, 15 of them is it is it a, a Tinubu that has respect and then you go to the east african side is it the guy whatever his name is in kenya or is it south africa so so you have to first of all look at yourself you know uh, the, the Igbos have this saying that you know you have to look good from the inside before the outside people can even notice so nobody's looking good from inside all they do constantly is run abroad go overseas go to paris go to london and, and seek assistance you know or advice well you say no i'm not going to do this you know one of the ways to deal with the western world is say i'm not going to do this i'm not longer going to toe your line so until you have that internal strength and be confident in what it is you want to push and let the world know there are no perfect nations every nation even america has its own challenges uk has it russia has it china has it but how come these people with all their challenges will still come to africa and look like angels mm -hmm. and then africans are just following them and kissing up to them is it now, recently, some of them went to China, and China is pro pro uh, promising them $50 billion. Divide that number with the 54 African countries, and this is over three years. That means nobody's even getting a billion dollar for the three years. And then Africans are excited about that. What the money you're asking China that don't even believe in, in Jesus and the Bible, it, it was not wired to them. Why don't you create your own currency and okay. give to somebody else? Uh, okay. But anyway. Uh, well, we understand we, we understand the issues. Uh, now that we are having uh, Hamas, we have Hezbollah's presence in this conflict uh, in Lebanon. We have the Syria, of course, and the impact as, um, of course, as we are recording in the regional um, scheme of things. And now when you look at the plays or the roles of the interplays of these uh, particular bodies or regions or countries, uh, as, as, as we put it, um, what implication would that have for Israel's security and um, regional balance of power? No, you know, since Israel was created in 1948, it's never had any peaceful time because, you know, it's like Israel was smacked in the middle of, you know, uh, land that the Palestinians said belongs to them. And that's what created the Hezbollah in the north, you know, and then, you know, the Hamas in the south. Uh, yeah, and I don't know whether you know this history, you know, the choice of Israel would have been uh, on the land between Libya and Uganda. But, you know, the president, uh, U.S. president at the time, I forgot what his name, canceled it and put them where they are. So since that time, they haven't had any peace. Because just like you can imagine, if you have a, a mansion and somebody in, you know, just in the middle of that mansion has their own home, and then he divides you, you know, divides you with your family on the both sides, and then what you're gonna do? So it's a human thing. There was an error in, in creation of Israel, and that error is what has, a, a, you know, it's exacerbated and enhanced all this friction. Uh, people have won Nobel Prize, you know, making peace for Israel, and then where are we with that peace? You know, again, I always have this, you know, questioning I do. If that's where Jesus was buried or, 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 or born, how come that's one of the most toughest part of the world? Mm. It, can Jesus send them something, you know, remote control, and then there will be peace? But Jesus ain't going to do that. Uh, because okay. even when he was here, it wasn't anything. No, no, I, I, want you, I want us to know this because it's a human factor. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with Muhammad or Jesus. The human beings have to come together, come to the table, look each other in the eye, say, what are we? fighting for you know there's always an opportunity cost what are you willing to give up in order for you if you can't answer that question of opportunity cost and what you're going to give up then you're going to be in a perpetual war yeah, and that's what is going on mm. what is israel going to do what is palestinians going to do and then the people that supply them the arms are not don't want this thing to end remember the mis uh, military industrial complex is a money-making machine and everybody since this is couch around security everybody wants security of you know properties and people so it's going to keep going if you stop that conflict from existing then all these companies that make billions of dollars what are they going to do so well, it's a human factor, and I don't know whether this is going to end, uh, but well, if it ends, it will be fine. I guess there's another twist to it, I must say. Uh, but finally, before I let you go, let's look at um, the U.S. role um, in the conflict. Um, there have been calls for a two-state uh, solution. Benjamin Netanyahu did not make any reference to that in his speech today. And um, I'm asking, what role do you think the U.S. can play in mediating the Israel-Hamas conflicts, probably, you know, influence a two-state uh, solution to this? Or do you think that the Israel relationship, that Israel's relationship in some way can actually influence some sort of peaceful resolution to this conflict that is having with uh, Palestine? 
You know, the two-step solution is not new. Everybody from Clinton, from Bush, from the president before now, you know, Ann Wasadat and the woman that has got Nobel Prize on it. Uh, it's not gonna. It's not gonna happen. Um, and, and and so because of that, it, it, again, it's like what is the magic one? You know, America is the reason Israel is emboldened. America created them. America was the ones that resettled and brought in all the Jews after the World War, and then I said, okay, here's where you're gonna go. So, America influence is very, you know, is very necessary in, in dissolving it. But here's what the challenge is. The Jewish Americans are the most effective organized ethnic group in America. There are 8 million Jews in America. Their effectiveness dominates African Americans, black people, including you know, 45 million, it dominates the other 45 or so million of Hispanic people. And of course, the white people love the money because the, me the Jewish people control the media as well as the money. And so when you funnel money to the politicians, you got them to start talking from both sides of their mouth. And, you know, the Palestinians that are in America are not as effectively organized. Mm. You know, they are, they are consumed with their own prestige and mansions and flashy cars. But the Jews are very very focused and very determined. Uh, and so not only uh, the, the Jews in America that affected the Jews all over the world, they will rally for cars, which other people are not willing to do. So until you build that structure and you become that strategic, you're never not going to get a result. Okay. You know how much money America gives Israel? America gets, Israel gets more money than any other country in the world. And here's another thing you want to know. There are more Israeli-based companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange than all of the companies in Africa that are listed on the Stock Exchange. Wow. So he, 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 people don't even really know this stuff. They just think, oh, Jews, you know, the Jews, for every black person, for every Jewish person in America, there are six black people. If two heads are better than one, how come one head is dominating the rest of the six? These are something people need to think about. These are something that people need to chew and not just run around PhD, doctor, blah, blah, blah while your own house is falling apart. I respect the Jewish people because, you know, it's a proof of quality is better than quantity. Okay. And uh, A.J. Kiopa, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Very insightful. Well, thank you for having me and have a very good weekend. You're I, looking good on that jacket, bro. I thank you very much.